Green Spring. Today we're going to talk with Joe Hartsoe, and he's the dapper gentleman that you often see with an elegant lady at either Fireside or Town Center. You also see him with the choristers, where he sings with the mellows. He's some great stories on the P-40s and B-25s, but really he flew mostly B-25s during World War II. And he had a very interesting career following the war. Uh, he's also has a, a, a good page in the Book of Us. So if you want to read more about Joe that we don't cover here, uh, go to the Book of Us and look at his page. I think uh, yeah, I have a, a picture of it right here. So this is uh, Joe's uh, Book of Us page. Well, Joe, uh, uh, before we start talking, I'd like to show uh, a couple of minutes of tape that I took in your apartment uh, that shows your trophy, trophy wall and a few other items that you, you were proud of. Good. So if we could roll that tape. <coughs> this is the trophy wall, and uh, Joe might, uh, well, those are some of the medals that he won in World War II. He's got his wings down below. It's a nice, it's a very nice uh, uh, frame. And there's a picture of the P-40 and the B-25. Now we're getting down to the B-25 with Joe looking out the window and his crew that's uh, it's pictured there. We're gonna go in and see a close up of that. There's his crew. And some other mementos, some nice pictures there, two pictures of the P-40 and the B-25. Uh, this is a, a, uh, an award that he got for being a champion softball player. And we'll talk a bit, little bit about that. I believe that was, oh, I missed that one. <laughs> And this is, has to do with the Rotarians, the Rotary Awards. So he was a big, he was, he was a major figure in the Rotary. This is an Erickson Tribune article on Joe. So this is his trophy. That's his wife and his parents. So this is a, uh, a trophy wall that Joe has and reminds him of his past. And Joe, since we're talking about your past, tell us a little bit about your early life. I was out of high school at 16. I had to work a couple of years before I could go off to college. In 1940, I started at NC State. And uh, well, where did you go? To, where did you live? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Weldon, North Carolina. Uh, that's about 35 miles north of Rocky Mountain. Near 95, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and your parents, parents, what did they do for a living? My, my father worked for the county, and uh, uh, we were we were an average family. But um, you lived in you lived in the town then. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I went to NC State. Uh, in 1940, and was there. I was home when Pearl Harbor day, and uh, six months after Pearl Harbor, I went down and took the examination for pilot training. What were you What were you studying in North Carolina State? I, I, I studied chemical engineering. Okay. And uh, so, right after Pearl Harbor, you went down to join up. Yeah. For flight training. Flight training, and I passed it. They said, well, go back to college. I'll, we'll, we'll call you later. Uh, I went back to college, and then nine months later, they called me. I went down to Miami. So this would be about 1942. Yeah. Yeah. I went through pilot training, uh, McBride, Missouri. Uh, well, before we get into in, into the Air, Air Corps, uh, what about your current family? You, you have current family living around here? My family? Uh, for 17 straight years, we had one or more of our four children 
in ten different colleges and universities. <laughs> that, that took a toll on the family finances, didn't it? <laughs> and uh, how many children did you have? We had four children. Four children. And what are they doing now? Uh, they, the oldest daughter, she's met her husband at Duke when she was at Duke. They were married to Duke Chapel. They, uh, then we went over to the Carolina, North, University of North Carolina, to the Car Carolina Inn for the wedding. Uh -huh. um, what are they doing? What, what is she doing now? Well, in her family, are there are three doctors. Uh, and uh, they, they live in Dunn, North Carolina, about 35 miles out of Raleigh. Oh, okay. Durham, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my oldest son, Joe, he comes out and has dinner with me about once a week. Good. He's a lobbyist for uh, the America. He's a lobbyist for uh, American Electric Power Company out of Ohio. Oh. He told me that his salary and bonus last year were more than the President of the United States. <laughs> He's I doing said, pretty well then, huh? <laughs> I said, well, how much did the say, president make? He said 485000 yeah, a year. Yeah. yeah, I would say he's successful. My middle son is a civil engineer. He married a, a, a lawyer with the World Bank, and they're the ones that have the triplets. Mm. And uh, the World Bank... They have a lot of perk. Yeah. Well, how many grandchildren do you have? I have 11 grandchildren. 11 grandchildren? And five. Any of them live around here? Uh, most of them do. Most of them? Oh, good. The uh, box children, six of those, they live here. Uh, uh, my youngest son is a lawyer. He has an office in... Uh, Fairfax and also one in, in uh, uh, Lees Leesburg. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you you lived around here before then, I know that, but let's let's bring this up to date here. Why did you move to Green Springs? I moved. Or when did you do it? I moved to Green Springs when my wife had a stroke in '05. She had a stroke. And she spent five years in Garden Ridge. Oh, okay. And she had another stroke and passed out, passed away. In 2010? About, 20, 20, about 2009. Oh, is that right? Okay. Uh, so, so the reasons for moving here was, was to take care of your wife and you'd be near her. Well, I did the same thing. I was, that's, that was one of the principal reasons I moved here at that time. If I looked back on it, I would know that I should have known to move in here much earlier. But I didn't know that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go back then a few years. Do you, do you have any good stories about elementary school or high school? You graduated at 16, but anything happened in high school that was any of any import? Not really. Not really? Okay. So you joined the Air Corps. You, you started your flight training down at Miami. So let's get into the uh, uh, into your Air Corps days. Army Air Corps days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, went through the uh, first primary at McBride, Missouri. Um, uh, basic at in Arkansas and uh, advanced in, in uh, Georgia. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you ever flew in a plane? Was it, was, it, was it the Air Force plane that you flew in first? Or had you ever flown before? I'd never flown before before yeah. in primary. Yeah. Do you remember the first flight you took? Well, the first flight that the instructor yeah. did everything, yeah. but it took me eight hours of instruction before I flew alone. But do you remember any sensations during that first flight? 
<laughs> well, the, the instructor said, <laughs> when, I, when after our first flight, he says, threw me in a brace and says, I flew the plane this time. Yeah, you're going to do it for now. <laughs> yeah. How about your first solo? Do you remember the? There, your first solo when the when he got out of the plane and says, "Okay, you take it around." <laughs> Not really. <laughs> okay, I uh, I just thought maybe you th those are pretty significant. Oh yeah, yeah. And I just thought you might have. Well, what were some of your assi of your assignments before going overseas? Do you remember any of those? Well, I, I got my wings and commission, and I was surprised that. Now this is nineteen. Well, this is nineteen uh, I got it in forty-three. Forty-three. Yeah. In, in, uh, in, in class 40, 43 C, okay. which would be March, and uh, uh, my orders were to report to Randolph Field in Texas for. Uh, Instructor training. Okay, so you were an instructor pilot before, uh, before you got an assignment overseas. Well, I I, I stayed nine months and uh, in the in the uh, command, and then I asked for. Okay. okay. Uh, now you uh, went from California to the Philippines. Uh, with your B-25, not in a formation, so you had to fly your B-25 from California all the way to the Philippines. What's the speed, what's the uh, range of a B-25? The range is about uh, 800 miles. Well, it's, more, eight, it's more than that, isn't it? Well, about eight, about 2,000, isn't it? Well, when we went, when I took it, flew it across the Pacific, we had gasoline in our Bombay Bay. Extra, uh, okay. extra so yeah. we had plenty of gas. So it, it would be able to fly about 2,000 miles? Uh, yeah. And that's about the distance from California to Hawaii. So you didn't have much gas left when you landed <laughs> in Hawaii. So you took some other hops to get to the Philippines, obviously. What's the speed of a P-25? We, we, we flew about 225 miles. About 225, okay. All right. Well, uh, if, if you uh, if you look at this uh, map, it's about a seven thousand mile tri trip from California to the Philippines on the Grand Circle route. You probably took about nine thousand miles to get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went. I hit many of our islands. I, I, they trip across to Hawaii and then. I hit about six or seven islands going over. Yeah. One of them, one of the, towards the end, the, we were all, uh, the only, we were the only person on the island. Oh, is that right? It was, had gasoline, had food there for us, but uh, my crew was the only one on the island. That's unusual, isn't it? And then some of those islands that I hit, the Marines had, uh, really put on a battle with the Japanese. But what was left, uh, the Japanese had built underground. Mm -hmm. They had structures came, that had slots about like that that the Marines took advantage of. Yeah. All right, you were stationed in the Philippines. Did you fly? You flew missions from the Philippines against the Japanese. Where did you fly to? Well, I got four stars on my Asiatic ribbon while I was in the Philippines. One for uh, troop support, one for the Western Pacific, and two for offense against Japan and China. Yeah. So you flew, did you fly against targets in, the Japanese targets in China? Yeah. And, and some of the other islands that were around for most of the Philippines. Formosa. Formosa. And uh, uh, the B-25, we carried five, 500, we carried four 500 pound bombs. Yeah. It was used for both bombing and, and, uh, and uh, 
we were hitting and shipping at mass stop. You were so you you had mostly as your uh, weapons, 500 pound bombs, four 500 pound bombs. Yeah. All right. Uh, you then went to the island of Ishima. Yeah. Yeah. And from there you flew again against targets. Uh, this, this time I, I assume more islands around. Is that we're on Aishima, which is the island off of Okinawa. Yeah. Uh, we were close enough to lower Japan. We were hitting targets in Japan. Oh, okay. Usually it was a target opportunity. Uh, were you expecting to participate in the invasion of Japan? I didn't know at that time uh, that we were scheduled to invade them. First of November. What? Well, okay, so, but but uh, you you would have been caught up in if, if we had had to invade Japan. You would have uh, been flying missions over Japan and probably from Iwashima uh, or Aishima. Now, um, when you first heard about the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, what were your? Do you remember what you were thinking? I was the officer of the day on the 1st of August, 1945, yeah. when the message came in that said President Truman had announced we now had a bomb 50 to 100 times more powerful than anything we had in the arts. I was carrying around showing the, the, the crews that were flying around the clock. Um, I was showing the message because they wouldn't believe it. And our cry was, bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> okay, it so all yeah. right, now, uh, you flew over Hiroshima and Nagasaki about a week after the bombs were dropped. And there's a film clip of your uh, flight over Hiroshima, which we'll show now. Um, yeah. Hiroshima, which was on August the 6th, 1945. And then Nagasaki on the 10th of, of uh, August, 1945. I was able to fly over Hiroshima about 10 days after it happened. We came in on, at about under, under 1,000 feet. And for miles and miles and miles, there was complete destruction right under where the bomb hit. The heat and radiation turned stones and iron melted them. Uh, human beings were turned into hunks of carbon. No other single weapon had ever caused such damage, such destruction, such horror, such despair. Over 140,000 people died instantly or within 100, within 30 days. The bomb used on Hiroshima was 16 kilotons, and the bomb used on Nagasaki was about 20 kilotons. Uh, so you saw the devastation from the 16 kilotons. And the, what I read, it said about four, uh, four square miles uh, in Hiroshima, and what uh, Joe described sounded like much more. Uh, I'd also uh, looked up the firebombing that we did in Tokyo on March the 9th and 10th of 1945. And the firebombing killed over 100,000 people, destroyed 16 square miles of the city, and about 267,000 buildings. 20 of our B-29s were shot down on that raid. That was March 1945, and the Japanese fought on. After the first atomic bomb was dropped, the Japanese military estimated that we had two or three more atomic bombs after uh, we dropped that one. And they believed that they could endure uh, two or three more uh, atomic bombs. What they didn't know is that we really would have been able to drop about a, a bomb about every two weeks. But after the second, uh, the, so they thought they could continue the war even after Hiroshima. So after the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Hirohito saw the folly in having Japan destroyed and he, he agreed and it caused the military to agree to unconditional surrender. And so when you think back on that, you've got to put things in perspective. Another perspective is that uh, the, the, uh, some of the payloads on our missiles, the Titan, for example, that you can read about in Command and Control by Eric Schlossberg, had a nine 
megaton warhead, which is over 500 times what the Hiroshima warhead was. All right, now you flew over Tokyo on the day of the surrender. Do you, can you recall that? General, Ma General MacArthur wanted five B-25s <coughs> for his staff, and I had the opportunity to fly one of them the 600 miles to Tokyo over the f first day of the occupation. I, I, uh, we arrived on, in Tokyo, and we had, we had to we had to go 10 or 12 miles to another airport to get to get catch a C-46 back to Aishima. Uh I was surprised at the welcome we received on that 10 miles because as we went got out on the highway, there were children, Japanese on both sides of the street, 18, 20 deep, oh on each side, playing instruments, uh, shouting, waving flags, uh, uh, all the way to the other side. There must have been a million Japanese on that route. So they were happy the war was over. Well, they did either. The, the military had taken over, yeah. and they were really hurt. All right, well, what did you do when you returned to the States? You, you went back to college, I assume, got your bachelor's in chemical engineering. Yeah, I was, uh, got, in 49, I got my chemical engineering degree one weekend and was married to Hazel Jones the next weekend. Next weekend. <laughs> she had a... Not much time between them. <laughs> right. She had her bachelor of science degree from McDonald. From okay, so you had a few chemical en engineering jobs after your graduation, but then you got into the civil service and you uh, came to the Pentagon and began to work for the Army Chemical uh, Office. Came to, I came to Washington working for the office of the Chief Chemical Officer. Yeah. When they had a <clears throat> billion billion dollar construction program, I was the chief of the construction division. So this was constructing plants to build uh, chemical weapons, the VX uh, plants, and, and the munitions that would carry the, yeah. the, nerve, uh, the nerve agents, other chemical warfare agents. Okay. And I'm so happy that all that VW and CW weapons that we made was never used. Not only were they never used, but they're destroyed now. Yeah. You didn't get in, you, you weren't in there when they built the demilitarization facilities at Pine Bluff and other areas. Up. Well, that was part of the at, billion, at Dugway. That was part of the billion dollar program. Was it? Okay. I, I, I was in the, I went to the demil facility out at Dugway. It was quite a, quite a place. Uh, all right, well then. After working in, how, how long did you work in the chemical, or uh, chief of chemical? Uh, I was there for f f five years, and then I went and took over uh, and was uh, finance director and program manager of one of the eight funded programs of the Army Material Command. The Army Material Command was stationed down on Eisenhower Avenue at the time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, did you work any for any civilian firms after retirement? No. No. You retired and you just hung it up. I did. Uh, I spent a year down at Quadico as a quality officer on a, on a, on a, on the base. All right. Well, you were a champion softball player. Could you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? I. Uh, I helped establish and develop the Northern Virginia Senior Softball League and uh, uh, played in it for 26 years. 26 Travel, years? Traveled all over the United States playing tournaments, Arizona. Uh, Were you, well, did you have a World Series of Senior Softball? In 89, they started a World Series. Ah. I played in five of the first five year. Five of them. So you really were a champion softball. <laughs> what position did you play? I played the second base. Second base? Okay. Uh, do you know Peggy Kellers? No. She's a champion softball player, too. Uh, 
And, and she lives over in Parkview. She'll have to meet her sometime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, y you were in the Rotary Club for 30 years. Yeah, I, after I retired from the Silver Service in 1980 and from the uh, Air Force Reserve in 81, I joined the Rotary Club in Annandale. And in 2006, I received uh, the Spiritual Rotary, which was one of the top awards that the president of Rotary International can give to an individual return. Is that is that one of the awards that you have on your right lapel? Yeah. I see. All right. <laughs> Do you have any other hobbies? Other than escorting attractive, elegant ladies around Greensboro here. My hobby is framing, framing. Is framing. Framing pictures. Framing pictures. I have oh. over 200 framed pictures in my wall. Is that right? And you you made them all? Well, this including the metal ones. Oh, this is a picture, by the way, of Joe and his B25. We saw it in the uh, apartment. But this is, maybe you can get a close-up of it. The Mighty Midget. The, the Mighty that's, Midget. That's what the crew wanted to call it. I said, what Fine. would you say was your major accomplishment in life, Joe? Well, I say in, my, in the page in the book of us that I'm proud of my military and civilian career, but I'm more proud of my family. Good. So your family's... And, and your most satisfying accomplishment is probably your family, too, though. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, Joe, thank you very much for coming on today. I, I appreciated talking with you. And, you know, we, we uh, this business of uh, the, the nuclear over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it, I, my, my whole career, well, not my entire career, but much of my career was in the nuclear weapons business. Good. I, I, I spent... Uh, three years uh, working at Livermore on them as a, an engineer and I was in the planning phases and I developed it or work, I was commander of the Army Nuclear Agency so I, I was much very much involved in the nuclear business but I appreciate you coming on today and so my pleasure and uh, well, good luck to you it's good to see you around and it's, it's nice to sing next to you in the choristers <laughs> so folks I've got just a couple of announcements here. Um.